Radio 16 WAAM presents the Ted Heisel Show, featuring interesting guests, timely interviews, and open lines. Ted wants to hear from you. The phone numbers are 971-1602 from the Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti area, or 525-1888 from Wayne and Oakland counties. Now, here's your host, Ted Heisel. Thank you very much on a Monday morning here on Radio 16, friends. This is Todd Heisel, and we will have our open lines this morning. And first of all, Ted, though... Ted, Ted, I have to interrupt you a little bit. Oh, who's this? This is Lloyd Johnson, oh, oh. Uh, president of WAAM Whitehall Broadcasting, and uh, we're going to kind of take things out of your hand here this morning. We're going to have a day of reminiscing. We know you had a great day on... Uh, Saturday, when between 11 and 1,200 of your friends showed up, and uh, the good Lord graced us with a beautiful, beautiful day for the entire 9 a.m. through 2 p.m., and a few of your good friends were still showing up about 10 after 2, wondering if they could still get in on it and shake your hand. But we're so grateful for all of those wonderful, wonderful loyal listeners who came to honor you on for your 40th anniversary of broadcasting and uh, interviewing in the Ann Arbor area on Ann Arbor Radio. So uh, we've got a few little surprises. We want to do a little reminiscing, Ted, this morning about those 40 years uh, in uh, in radio in Ann Arbor. And uh, we've got uh, some of your old friends lined up that are going to be calling on you today, some of them by telephone, some of them in person. So, uh, where so, are they? Uh, well, we're, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have them come in here. We, we want it to be a surprise, so we didn't have them... Uh, in here standing around because knowing uh, this is a surprise knowing how gregarious that uh, that you are uh, we we knew that we'd probably never get you in the studio even if you got to uh, talking radio with some of these old friends okay uh, Ted here is a voice from the past that uh, you may recognize good Mr. afternoon Carefully. welcome to the so University of Michigan football the stadium the for you. this the surprise party for Ted Heisel that's, that's uh, Steve Filipiak. That's the way he used to do it. Welcome to the University of Michigan football stadium. Steve Filipiak, that's the voice that came in there. And uh, is Steve around? Well, I think he is, yes. Uh, hey, come on in here, Steve. Uh, <laughs> Steve Filipiak. Happy 40th. Please sit down there. I think a little uh, older. <laughs> well, what was the, well, what, of course, nobody else does, do they, Steve? <laughs> no. Steve, what was the name of that the theme song? Here, get that. Uh, what was the name of that theme song you used to have? Uh, 12th Street Rag. 12th Street Rag, yes. Pee Wee Hunt. Pee Wee Hunt. Played it for 14,000 times. <laughs> I tried to play that on the harmonica, and I almost ended up with a hernia, brother. You know, that was, that was yeah. a lively one. That's, That's the way Steve one. always came on the air. Well, and, Chad, this is a great, great time for you, and you well deserve it. Well, Steve, listen, I, I didn't see you Saturday. Well, I didn't want to show up Saturday, and then you figured, well, you know, this is a surprise, so I wanted to be here for a surprise. You know, that came off my head. It was the last scab of the spider bites. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is, a, this is a very important day because how many other people have been on as long as you have? You, you were at Kitty Hawk when the Wright brothers were successful, and here you are still today. Well, this is a great career. Still uh, playing guy. <laughs> I used to uh, send signals back and forth to Marconi. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a long career and a very, very fruitful one, and I think a very good one for the local area. I wonder if Bud Lester uh, knew about this. Uh, remember Bud? Uh, uh, oh, yes, sure, he was yeah. your personal friend. Bud was uh, an innovator, and he was 20 years ahead of his time. That's right. And Meredith Bixby, who started... Yeah. Uh, O W O I A. Yeah, that's where you worked with Ted. Was W O I A, yes. wasn't yeah. it, uh, Steve? You know, yeah. uh, the one nice thing about Bud Lester is that uh, we were uh, spinning records one day, as everybody did, and we stopped and we said, "Hey, why don't we just have people call in?" And Bud Lester went along with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, he started with you, uh, the uh, broadcast of the council meetings right. from City Hall. Right. And uh, Lucy and I did a show from an airplane over Ann Arbor. Lucy. Remember? Yes. And, uh, well, listen, that, the funny incident about that is Lucy and uh, Steve were in the airplane broadcasting down. It was a big 
uh, flight day up there. Right. Took Airport. off from Ann Arbor Airport. Yes. And then they, they hooked up the parachutist, and he was going to describe as he was coming down. And the funny thing was, he didn't care about jumping. That didn't frighten him. <laughs> but he would he couldn't talk on the air. <laughs> that scared him. That's right. It froze up in the microphone. Yeah. That's but, right. Uh, where was where was your WOIA studios located? On Brasso Road, on the uh, Saline Ann Arbor Road. After you get past the um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the uh, the lake That's road, the same road. location where our neighbor WIQB is. Yes, yes yeah. exactly. And NRS exactly. is located there. Yeah. Yes, very uh -huh. precious ground, if but only knew of Traverse Point right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly is today. No question about that. But you have seen a lot of things come and go. And, and Steve used to be manager out here. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, the WHRB. You know, uh, uh, that was. Starting back about 40 years ago mm -hmm. that you're talking oh, yeah, about. Yeah, 1947. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, this was a dirt road, just a two-way dirt road. Mm -hmm. And we used to do programs out of the uh, outside with Ollie McLaughlin, Scooby-Doo. and uh, Ollie had 25,000 personal card-carrying card members. I know. He would be <clears throat> extremely pleased to have had the opportunity of being here oh, today. Yeah. Now, yeah. shortly yeah. after I bought the station seven years ago, WAAM, <clears throat> he called me, and I had a wonderful conversation with him, and, and he filled me in on a lot of that early history. Well, he was, he was special. Lawn, yeah, he was, you know, and Saturday nights when Holly would have a show out on the front lawn, people, he was the best baby, biggest babysitter in, this, <laughs> in the Washtenaw County because the parents knew that they were in good hands. And we'd have a couple of sheriff deputies out here directing traffic. And then Ted Johnson with his pajama party would start after that. Right, yeah. right. Ollie yeah. and his Scooby-Doo. In fact, uh, you know, there's there's a little uh, race relations that went on there because people didn't give uh, blacks jobs in those That's days right. in radio stations. And Ollie really was the first. Uh, well, a wonderful uh, leadership person like him in the community was certainly good. Very, for, very for much that. so, Lloyd. Very much so. He was... He was one of a kind. He just an uh, outstanding personality. And I know when the when the services were held at the um, yeah. St. Andrews, I ushered at his, Ernie uh, Harwell came yes. up and he, uh, he presided. presented a eulogy uh, for um, the memory of Ali. Yeah, those were those were outstanding days back then. When it never, I, I have never seen at one time locally or anywhere else that many people. Well, air personalities at one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, today, for instance, we used to give jobs to uh, University of Michigan uh, students. You know John Rich. You remember John right. Rich? He's right. one of the outstanding producers in television. Yes. has been for years. Uh, Mord Zarkov, he was head of Columbia Pictures right. when he worked here with Don Herman. And he never got the baseball scores or names right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it were the Detroit Cardinals and the right. St. Louis right. Blues. and it was But uh, there were many, many names that, uh, of course, I'm getting so nice, yeah. I can't remember too much, but uh, in the way of uh, names. But at one time, Lloyd, for a period of about five to ten years, all of this happened with all of these unusual people. In Joel Sebastian, Dave Joel, Prince. Yeah. I, I remember. I remember a green sportscaster one time had somebody in tenth place when there were only eight teams in the league. <laughs> <laughs> we did a show. John Carroll. You remember John yes, Carroll? Yes. We did a program of uh, covering the uh, Ypsilanti Ann Arbor High football game from Ypsilanti by the river, and it was raining. Frog Island. Oh yeah, raining like you like you have never seen. And it got so you couldn't see the markers on the field. You couldn't see the numbers on, on the jerseys. Mm -hmm. So John and I split up on the thing. He would take it for one series of plays by one school. I would take the other. Neither one of us knew what we were doing, but it was exciting. <laughs> and so finally, he, got to say, he says, I think it's your turn. I said, no, I think it's yours. We didn't know what Steve was <laughs> playing at the time. Steve, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an experiment, uh, with the Ann Arbor News, uh, tried out an election return right from the newspaper, which in those days the newspaper and the radio did not, not get along. Not the CNI. Yes. They would erase the call letters if there were a picture taken of me or uh, anyone of the, on the staff in the newspaper. They would say local announcer. <laughs> and it was under Bud Lester well, that we started them that's, on that's a regular place, basis. Uh, one way we basis. progressed a right. long way, Steve, oh, because yes, our, yes. our good friend Don Faber from the Ann Arbor News came to our party on Saturday. Oh, and, great. Uh, we were He's, very pleased to have them. Great. I hear that Tommy O'Brien called you. Yes, Tom O'Brien. Yeah. We gave him his start at WOIA. Right. And if he'd have stayed in radio, we'd have been outstanding. And Lucy he had uh, John Landecker come over, who yes. turned out to be the number one disc jockey at yeah. one time right. in the country. He's in Cleveland now. Is that right? Yeah, WJW. And uh, going over... 
uh, like a, well, a bomb, I would think, a just outstanding success in Cleveland. We're going to be back. This is Peggy Haynes, the county clerk, Register of Deeds, wishing congratulations to Ted Heisel on his 40 years of service to the Ann Arbor listening area. We all want to tell Ted how much we appreciate his contributions to the community. Well, thank you, Peggy. Steve, uh, back uh, in... One thing before we, before we go on is that Ted was the greatest walking ad for apples. For apples? Days. Ted always had at least one apple in his pocket. Keeping all the doctors away with And him. he would munch on an apple, and I, I see uh, it day after day, Ted would always have an apple. People used to take bets on whether they could ever catch him without an apple right, in his pocket. Right. Well, while we were uh, uh, listening to the commercials there, Ted, we were talking about what the size of the staff was at WOIA and some of the special projects and commercials that you people were, were pioneers uh, in. Well, uh, let's see, there were there were two reporters. One of them was a, is an outstanding award winner now, Steve Kane. He was out there at that time, just getting started when he was getting into the news work at, at the uh, Ann Arbor News. Then there was Lucy, there was uh, Jim Allen, there was uh, Dick Harner, there were you and I, and uh, then we had two or three others. Uh, I'd say about 12 to 15 people. Mm-hmm. And you said that you uh, were some of the pioneers in multiple voice commercials at that time? Yep. See? Don Herman. Well, that was here before we went to yep. WOA. Then we carried it on over there when we when we all ended up there, Lucy and uh, the whole gang. But uh, here, we at those times, we only had the records, no tapes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. blank records that we would uh, inscribe the commercial or whatever we would uh, have on it. And I know then that uh, Don Herman, who was uh, our program director, uh, he was he was out of this world, and he came up with these ideas, and we'd do multiple, multiple voices and and comic commercials that uh, didn't start till about 20 years after that. Some, after of, we some started. of Ted's uh, early he, dialects and uh, special voices, I suppose. He well, no, Steve Steve was good at that, and we oh, what was the king? What was that funny voice you had? It was the king. Oh yeah, well, well, we started this. How did that go? That was uh, any time something would happen, and Herman got me up in a get up with a squash top hat that was slanted on one side and an old uh, uh, long tail coat and a, uh, a scarf. And I looked like I just got off the uh, last freight train. Uh, off, off the last box And car. looking for empty bottles in the container. You know, that kind of a character with a smashed old cigar butt that I was carrying around. And so we cre created this character to come up as a, and he would throw it in any time during the day, on station break or after commercial or something. And he would say, well, your majesty. Yeah, uh, your majesty. Uh, uh, <laughs> what's, uh, what's with you today? Well, sport, let me tell you. Uh, the other day, I was on the campus over here uh, on, the, on the university, and my, you know, they used to say four to five girls are beautiful. Fifth one comes to Michigan. And I found out that that wasn't so. There are a lot of beautiful girls. Can you, by the way, can you let me have $2 till tomorrow? That kind of a character, see? And we would pop these and, things and in. And you'd pop it in almost any time. Any time. Uh, news yeah, you never knew when His Majesty was coming around. <laughs> and then when Frank Babcock uh, bought the station, I had gone then. I'd come back in 70, yeah, you know, seven, late 69. And uh, He was a big voice. He was the big Chicago. voice at that time mm -hmm. of Cadillac and... Uh, Marlboro cigar cigarettes, and he was the voice of the Chicago Bears, an outstanding voice, an outstanding talent, and an outstanding individual. And he would come up with ideas. He said, uh, let's try this. So what we would do, would tape four or five of these things, and I would come on with different voices, just with a line or two. We'd then bang the door would shut with a bang, and... Uh, Never overdone. Never. Just uh, always underplayed. That, In fact, uh, they, uh, then they drop them off and bring them back. Right. Right. Did you have any uh, studio musicians back in those days, or uh, was that, uh, I know that they, they had no. studio musicians, but no. uh, you no. were into the uh, we records had... and uh, for no, music. No, what they did do at HRV once, uh, I remember when uh, I was still in school, they had a, an orchestra in town of Glenn Miller's brother, Herb Miller, mm -hmm. and the HRV. I don't think I've ever used... heard of Herb Miller. Yes, Herb yeah. Miller had his orchestra, and they would play at the Michigan League, right. and the HRV would uh, pick it up from there. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. We would have a program on Sunday afternoon. Uh, Jean, uh, the accordionist. Oh, uh, yes. She and what was his name? Jean? Schumann? Schumann. Oh, Gene Schumann. Gene Schumann used to play on a program here Sunday afternoon. Is that right? Well, Gene Schumann has played for our Whitehall Convalescent Home for oh, many, great. many years, 25 years. And he has a brother that's a drummer. Yes. Uh, he's uh, a legend. Uh, and just like, like our friend Reed uh, 
Pierce, who passed away just a little while yes, ago. Yes, just a few, uh, and, a few weeks we ago. Would, we would do a lot Howard of Howard Schumann right? was, uh, uh, was an all-state football player when they only picked 11 guys mm. in yeah. the whole state of Michigan. He was very We good. would do a lot of remotes in those days. Mm -hmm. We'd go on location. For instance, out of Weber's, we used to do uh, the organist at the Michigan Theater. What was his name? Paul Tompkins. Paul Tompkins. He used to be a featured artist at Weber's. We would go out there and do a half hour in the evening. Mm -hmm. uh, we would go down uh, to create any occasion of welcoming the students back to the campus after after the summer or something. And then we'd, we'd uh, be in a, in a uh, position, location-wise, that drew people from any direction, and they would come down and watch this. Well, the, the nightclub at the... Uh uh, w O I A. Uh, uh, yeah. Remember that uh, from what was the restaurant uh, in downtown Ann Arbor, where the great seafood is now? Right. Oh, that was. Um, oh my gosh, yes. Uh, and they had a little orchestra there. That was they, the old Rubaiyat. The That's what? when it started. The, the Rubaiyat. Yeah, the Rubaiyat. Yes. And then moved down to the corner of. Uh, they had a piano player there that used to play with Ted Weems. Right. They had a little orchestra, and they right. used to do that in the evenings. Now, but you see, remotes in those days didn't cost what they do but now with right. telephone lines. Right. You know, you get it for sure. 25 bucks or so. Yeah. Uh, did uh, you have the great concern for the rating services back then? No. Or did you just figure never, that uh, you were the people to listen to and you went ahead? I never and, cared. That Ted and I have talked this over many times. I never cared about a, a rating service. In the first place, when you bought into a rating service, and I always had to fight this with these bucksters who came in trying to sell us, and they would sell it to somebody else locally, they would give me a nice bow or acknowledgement because I paid for some of this. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what I'm doing is actually is buying something that I'm not sure of, except that if I had stayed off of it, they would make me look, the other uh, part of the story, uh, not even available mm -hmm. for listenership. But I didn't care. I used to tell, when I, when I was managing, I was also on the street selling, and I had two radio programs here at the same time. Outside of that, I had lunch, and that was a day, you see. <laughs> but uh, I used to say to the people when I was trying to sell them advertising, I says, well, you got Bud Guest on with the sunny side of the street. you got a kid starting by the name of J.P. McCarthy. I said, so what? That's for Detroit. And if a number of people like to listen to it, nothing wrong with that. But I would rather have 500 local listeners who would listen to my commercials that we would put on and buy from those merchants, then I have a 50,000 audience who wouldn't buy locally. You were you were trading numbers for credibility. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the, the numbers game is still going on. Millions of dollars are spent, especially in TV, mm -hmm. to prove to the buyer that uh, they've got that listenership. Then when they find out they don't, they give free time to these people to give them back something for the money they spent. To me, it's a, it's a circle that has no ending, and it goes on and on. And wh why? If people listen... They don't tell me how many times they leave the show, uh, turn it because of a commercial is on. Most commercials are turned off, and they are listened to on TV. <laughs> Steve was a classmate of Mike Wallace. Oh, was he? Yes, yeah. we graduated here together. Oh, at that's time. interesting. They were both in and, uh, theater and... Uh, well, Mike is still going strong. How come you're not still going <laughs> strong, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> well, I decided to get off the merry-go-round many times and let, let the younger ones go on. But Mike was just as good when we were in school here at the, uh, in the communications uh, major than he is today, as he is today. He was a natural, mm -hmm. except he developed a style through the years and became uh, an outstanding uh, radio as well as a TV personality. And for some darn reason, uh, his, his hair didn't turn gray like the rest of us. I always <laughs> wanted to ask him the secret to that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but after a while, he didn't care. No, he was... He oh, was of course, his special. son, Chris Wallace, has made a name for himself. Yep. Uh, you, you never uh, stayed in close touch with him after he left the university? We did for a number of years, yes. I, I worked When I worked in Chicago for a spell in between uh, my career here, Mike and I were in Chicago at the same time, and uh, he had one of the first talk shows originated from the Shea Paris nightclub in Chicago. I used to see Mike frequently at the time. There were two other graduates at that time working in radio. We, I, we were with CBS the three of us, and Mike was what they call a freelance. Mike could work uh, any radio station or any network. And we'd get together time and time again and reminisce like we're sitting here. But uh, Mike was an overnight success because he, first of all, did the announcing at the Lone Ranger shows, the WXYZ. I see. Mike left uh, here when he graduated, got a job at XYZ. Mm -hmm. Then he got a job at Grand Rapids. 
then he went to Chicago, and he was an outstanding hit. And during the war, when he went away and came back, he picked up that first day he was back in Chicago as if he had been there all along. Mm. So he well, was a very, very unusual person. We'll be back. I'm Congressman Carl Purcell, Ann Arbor and 2nd Congressional District. I personally want to congratulate Ted Heisel for an outstanding career in the uh, radio business. I've known Ted for some 20 years, and uh, I guess I understand he may be the original uh, talk uh, host show uh, uh, person in America. I'm uh, impressed with his uh, credentials, his community leadership, and I've been very proud to participate with him over the year doing his uh, various talk shows. So congratulations, Ted Heisel. Well, thank you, Carl, as we're reminiscing here. Uh, what is this, from Traverse City? We have a call from Traverse City. Hi. Hello. Hey, Ted. Who's this, this Bud Lester? No. Is, is this Tom Corbett? You got him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I couldn't make it to the big shebang you had on Saturday, so I just wanted to call and wish you uh, congratulations on what I understand is your 40th anniversary uh, behind the mic. That's right, Tom. We want to thank you for calling. Hey, no problem, Ted. It's good to talk with you again. How are you doing up in Traverse City? Doing real well. Real well. TV is a uh, different ball game. It's a lot of fun. I'm out in the field a lot, uh, covering everything from plane crashes to forest fires to whatnot. Uh, I really enjoy it. A lot of fun up here in Traverse City. It's a real nice place to live. Mm -hmm. Well, we're certainly happy that you called, Tom. Well, just wanted to call and uh, we, wish you congratulations. We remember working with you and uh, very happy to have had you with us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, when I was at WAAM, it uh, was... Uh, my best years in broadcasting were there, and uh, you know it was a, a kickoff point for my career, and I really have fond memories of working with you all, including you, Ted. <laughs> Lloyd Von Salem. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I was pleased to see you uh, personally here uh, last weekend, and uh, you said you missed some of the exciting news stories that breaks in this Ann Arbor and southeastern Michigan area that uh, sometimes doesn't happen quite as often up there in, in that beautiful Traverse City Bay country. It's a beautiful area, but there are times where, uh, let's just say, not too much goes on at night. And, uh, you know, being a, a born and bred Ann Arborite, uh, you tend to miss it at times, but still, uh, northern Michigan is by no means overrated. It's a real nice place to live. It's, it's a beautiful place, that's for sure. And thank you so much for your participation in our show this morning. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Teddy. Congratulations. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Steve, let's not forget Don Bailey there. Right. That, uh, before we go into that, Lloyd, the thing about, and while we're, honoring Ted today with his 40th anniversary is that from the first time that Ted came on the air, I knew the reason for his success, and you'd be here a long time. In fact, you'll be here another 30 years, I think. <laughs> no, we, we, reason, we promised him another 40 here. But the reason is because he was believable. He was he was down to earth. He, he was believable by the audience, and they knew that he wouldn't give him a bum steer on whatever he said or whatever he advertised. And no, it's that's a, that's, a quality. that's You see that very few people have, even in big time TV, mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. actors and they put on something. Of course, he's an actor, but he's himself. When, he, when he's himself, he's acting, uh, and he can't be beat. Well, you know, he was so successful in that term on the school board that he served that uh, if he hadn't loved Ann Arbor so much and had been willing to go to Lansing, he probably could have been governor. He could have. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Uh, uh, getting back to the reminiscing, uh, remember uh, the Don Bailey did a show here too, and he'd play music. But you see, this was a knack that he had. Lloyd, he would buy 78-sized uh, uh, records, and uh, they would have music on it, but they would have a chance for the person who could sing the tune, like Don Bailey. Oh, yeah. He would come on while the record is playing. He would come on with the vocals for that particular mm -hmm. song. Sound like he was being... Playing being with an orchestra right back here. Back by a 12-piece band. Right, and it was here every Saturday, every Saturday yeah. uh, morning. He, he owned a TV right. show, then. Right. It's a shop. Yeah, right. And then he managed the apartment uh, restaurant uh, in the Huron Towers. I guess he's back in Florida. That's what I hear, yeah. And then you said Harry... Uh... Well, Harry Wismer, at the time I was here managing, Harry lived right near outside of, um, of Ypsilanti at the what now is the Cliffs on the Point. Mm -hmm. He had a oh, home yes. there. And uh, on weekends, if he was coming home on weekends, he would come and do... He was on the air on ABC at that time with the around 6.15 with the sports show. So Harry would come here and do the show direct from our studios. Mm -hmm. And uh, matter of fact, right at the end of the hallway here, that's where the studio was. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we, uh, 
and we went on with that for quite some time. We got started with the coaches who uh, would come and uh, do their program, and uh, Bump Elliott was the first one. We you didn't about. have to pay him in those days. Right. <laughs> and Bill Fleming was doing some work here, too, at mm -hmm. that time. Before he flowered. Didn't over. Harry Wismer's brother, wasn't John Wismer a brother of Harry Wismer yeah, that had the station in uh, Port Huron? Port Huron, that's mm -hmm. exactly right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Harry was a, was at Michigan State, and he would commute on Saturdays. Mr. Richards, who owned the station, WJR at that time, had a liking for Harry, and he would come on weekends and do a program at WJR. Eventually became the general manager of uh, WJR. So uh, there, there was a lot of this... Uh, Touch of, uh, you know, we have another uh, another pioneer in the radio business in this community, and he's uh, part of our sales staff now at uh, WAAM. That's Tom Johnston. Johnston with a T. With a T. You know, I have a little dirty trick that I play on, on people, uh, Steve and, and Tom. Uh, you know, the oldest trick in the book is that if you forget someone's name, you walk up and say, how is it that you spell your name again, your last name? And I always say, without the T, and I don't help them one little bit. So I'm a Johnson without the T. Tom Johnston with a T. Well, it was Tom, Tom back in those early uh, days. Uh, Tom, uh, <laughs> while Tom is here, and I, and I, could, I couldn't understand, or you couldn't solve the, what I thought was a puzzle of how this could happen. But Tom Johnston, when he was here on our staff, used to tape the football games and basketball games of the high schools and then sell it the next day on a uh, repeat basis. And I thought to myself, how can this be? He's, he's quite a salesman because the game was over and the paper showed the, the score, but Tom had a, 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 an idea and it was quite successful. The people would tune in. He sponsored, He sold the show to sponsors and they would replay the thing, rebroadcast well, it. Well, Tom it, actually started with the coach's corner. He was the first one right. to have all the coaches on the air on yep. Saturday morning. That was his idea. And then he, uh, then he started with the Celine Hornets. That's right. We, when we were at OIA, we couldn't, uh, we were, uh, had to go off at sunset. And, uh, uh, of course, you know, we did the sports. And uh, uh, I remember going down to Bud Stein and Ward Gates, who I think it's wonderful that they are still, the company, Stein and Gates, still is a sponsor on local radio, right. which tells you something about the loyalty yep. and the strength of, radio as an advertising medium yep. for 15 minutes i think they paid three dollars a spot for three one minute spots and we started putting on the high school coaches and before long we expanded that to an hour we'd have them call in and gary sanch who uh does some of the uh play-by-play -play here with john fountain for eastern michigan used to come in and take football scores for me and uh don howe you remember don yep. he used to do that and he's now a, a broadcaster somewhere. And, uh, he used to broadcast the Pistons. Well, he right. got a job at JR after he left here. He got a job at JR as a right. coach. And so was John Fountain, wasn't he here? John, John came in John here, Fountain. and he took over the sports when I left to go to 50 in Detroit. Right. And then Larry Zimmer also. Larry was Zimmer, there. right. There was, a, there was a career there locally that he went to Denver from here and still there, doing the pro and the local, local uh, sports there. But we did a lot. Of, we did a lot of uh, sports uh, at WAM when I came over from OIA. We uh, yeah. Bob Wagner they had had an afternoon sports show on, and and uh, we we were able to. Uh, in those days, they they didn't even know schools didn't even really know what to charge for uh, rights fees. I mean, they were so happy to have you do right. something. They right. little schools, for example, on the high yeah. school level, would put up a. Um, uh, uh, you know, a, a press box in effect you stand right. out in the open. That's right. And uh, we used to we used to replay the game. We used to have a game of the week, and then we replay one on Saturday morning, do a live one. Yeah. This Friday thing that I mentioned with John Carroll when we did the play-by-play -play, uh, of the Ann uh, Arbor uh, Ipsy game, we, they had built a special box on a telephone pole, and we sat out there in the driving rain. <laughs> I remember doing, that doing this broadcast. It's unbelievable. But Tom's been a contributor here in the early radio days. That has been copied now and is a normal standard thing. They still do rebroadcast, not even on that big deal. Well, then it was under Bud Lester, though, that, uh, that you, really, you got yeah. us up on South, right. you, right. Uh, for the first of the art fairs. Right. And in right. those days, the art fair was just in that one place. It wasn't the big mob that it is now all over. Right. 
it's too big now. Well, he was Mr. South U like you were Mr. Ann Arbor. No. And, uh, <laughs> he used to know everybody, State Street. everybody, State Street. I mean, that was Steve's well, the, bailiwick. The, the kick out of the whole thing, Tom, and you've experienced this too, as Ted has, is that it was not only saleable, but it was interesting. This is what we all try to do, and I think we carried it off very, very well through the years. And otherwise, it would have never gone on. It, it may be a one-time shot, and that would be it, come up with another idea. But we carried this thing on for years. You did. Ted, Ted's still doing it. So. But then the, uh, uh, what, really, uh, what really happened is that uh, PAG was the first to come on in 45. Right. And under Art and... Uh, Paul Green. Art Paul Green. Paul Green. Yeah. And then uh, HRV in 47. Later, right, in 47. And then... Uh, W-O-I-A-N-57. 57. 57. 57. Yeah. I was so trying to think of the year. Ted, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, with all of your experience in uh, the Civic Theater and all, did you uh, people here ever ever produce any original radio dramas or anything well, here? Well, we used to at W-U-O-M. Mm-hmm. At W-U-O-M you did, there yes. Were scripts, mm-hmm. yes. And, and uh, do you utilize the students that were, uh, right. were dramatic, uh, right. dramatic art students? And... Uh, who would do the writing for those, or would you use a script that was already uh, well, they, written? They usually school? were scripts. So, well, they had people writing scripts. They had the, the forces then to do that. I know this instructor down at WWJ, uh, we he had uh, several young ladies uh, that uh, modesty was at a little higher level in, the, in those days, and he'd get some of these risque scripts and uh, for practice would have us reading those parts, and of course he would sit there and roar with laughter as everybody would blush all over the place. Uh, he had 19 and 20 year olds, you know, and uh, many of whom had never met each other before, and who were uh, were sort of uh, playing lovers and romantic interests and that type of thing. And, Civic uh, Theater used to rehearse in the storage room of WPAG. Well, you know, talking about uh, on the air uh, plays and, and dramas and all that, we started back in those days where, say, for instance, Kerry Grant would be opening up at the Michigan Theater. I would, they would make a call, or we would place the call because he was all set for it, and the, I would interview him in the afternoon, usually around 1 o'clock or 1.15, and uh, maybe a two, three minute interview on the air. They would send a script mm-hmm. to yeah. us, and we would do this with, with many, many stars who were, who were uh, being featured. At the uh, Ted, Ted, we've got another guest here. We'd like to have you listen to this voice for a moment and see if you can identify this voice out of your past. Joe Stepik. Thanks for uh, many, many years of working together with you at another radio station. Um, I'm proud of your achievement of 40 years in broadcasting. Um, proud you taught me the magic and imagination of radio. Um, as you once told me, television has imagination, but only expands it up to 21 inches, whereas radio goes on forever. You also taught me how I could come in on Saturday mornings, for example, and not have to shave because it was radio. You also taught me how to... Uh, eat an apple on the air while talking with people on community comment. Best of luck to you. Congratulations. You're part of radio history, and I thank you for it. Well, that's the nice and lovely voice of uh, Joe Stepik, who used to sit in. <laughs> he was the only one that would sit in uh, for us uh, when we went on vacation. So, Joe, welcome. Thank you very much. Too. Joe, Hi. come in here. Hi, guys. Long time. It has been. Good to see you. This is like coming home, Ted. Well, thank you, Joe. It's it's nice to see you again. Hey, we're going to, uh, uh, let me see here. Yes. Hello there. Yes. How are you, Ted? I'm fine. Oh, good. Congratulations. We enjoyed your party on Saturday. This is Katie Rankin. Well, Katie, thank you for coming. Well, we were glad we could, and I wanted to also invite your listeners to come on Friday to the Women's City Club to uh, enjoy the tables and tea that's going to be there. Are you familiar with that? The Tables and Tea. Tables and Tea. This is the second year that they have done this at the City Club. And um, we want to be sure that people know that the City Club does provide a meeting place for many charitable events and volunteer groups. And this is to support the facility of the City Club. And it's it's really an interesting uh, kind of display. There will be 35 different table settings. Mm-hmm. And uh, there will be it's a five dollar admission, and tea and refreshments are served, and then also luncheon will be a- available for six fifty. What are the hours? From eleven to four. Eleven to four. And that's Friday, June eighth. I'll send Steve over there. Eleven to four. Yeah. Well, that's fr- uh, Friday, June eighth. That's right. Is that this Friday? That's this coming Friday. Okay, yes. Katie. Eleven to four. Uh huh. 
All right, dear. Hey, okay. thanks for calling. You're very welcome. Say hello to Dwayne. I will. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. As we, uh, uh, there was something I want to remind you of that uh, back in those uh, those early days when we were all uh, trying to put on something different at the time that uh, Bud Lester and uh, uh, I, I completely forgot it, so fill me in here, Steve. <laughs> when, when we very were, important, man. When we were at WIA? Yes, with Bud and Tom. And we all know what uh, uh, the pluses and the failures of the stations. And Tom, Tom was out of WIA one day and started here the next. <laughs> Those things happen, though. And, and, you know, it's small town, and uh, really, in broadcast, all of us have worked at, at all three of the stations in Ann Arbor, and I think all experiences have been uh, good experiences. And, and I'd like just for a moment to say one thing. When I was a young guy starting out in the broadcast business, I always remember that both you, Ted, and particularly Steve in sales and everything, always encouraged me, and I appreciate that. I mean, not that you guys are that much older than I am, <laughs> quite a bit, but I always appreciated the fact uh, that you have always encouraged young people uh, in the business, and it's a tough business to be in, but uh, that's something I'd like to say to you. Well, we, we were talking about those early on. Uh, well, it actually, it was a, it, to use the over, over, overly used expression, Tom, it was more of a family. Uh, this is a right. team. The reason the Pistons were great is because they played as a team. They were all great. Mm -hmm. And we were the same way as a family back then. Tom well, was outstanding with ideas and, and everything. We all went our way, but we all were together mm -hmm. because we wanted to augment the other's opportunity to go on with something that well, you was know, a winner. When you, when you stop to think of those... Uh, those early owners, uh, we talked about Bud, and he was—he uh, let you be creative and, right. and change That's things. Right. And I have to hand it to Mr. Bond. In those days, we ran the thing anyway, so we did what we wanted here. <laughs> and I have to hand it to Ted Bond, who was probably the best businessman ever in uh, in radio. True, he he, he you know, was the, the stock markets every day. Yeah, that's right. He made radio a success and uh, under Lloyd uh, Lloyd is probably the most compassionate of all the He had a fascinating story about uh, the Green Brothers and how he finally uh, acquired um, the old WPAG. Um, he was working out of Pontiac at, at the time as a salesman and Is that right? Yeah, he was selling selling airtime for WPOM. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's when I first got to know him. And I have a, an ancillary story that uh, goes back to my days with Armed Forces Television Radio. Uh, it turned out when I wound up in northern Italy doing some broadcasting there with the Southern European Network, the equipment was being replaced, but it was equipment that came from the Blue Danube Network in uh, Austria. Uh, and when Austria went neutral in um, the mid-50s, they shipped that down. It turned out that equipment was uh, requisition from WPAG in the that right? That's very Still had the pebbles and the numbers. Hey, Ted, we have to mention Meredith Bexie, probably the nicest, nicest person. That you wonderful know. man, and, and Mrs. Bexby, too. Yes, yes, and I did a lot of voices for them and their puppets that went all over the Thank you once again, friends, as we have been joined by more friends here as we discuss old, old-time radio here in Ann Arbor. Jim Bond is with us, the general manager of WPZA and the part owner and the former uh, manager of WPAG. His father owned in downtown Ann Arbor. We were talking about your dad earlier, Jim, that, uh, you know, in, in my experience, he's probably the best business manager radio has ever seen in this area. We made a real success out of it, out of uh, local radio, and uh, and uh, now you're in that spot, and you were in that spot, and uh, we think about some of the old names that uh, that your father had there at the radio station when you were a little kid. You're right, I was a little kid. You remember that? I was six years old when they put the station on the air, and had a chance to meet all the initial people. I, I don't remember some of them because it was too small at the time, but some of the key people that were there, like Howard Heath. And, Bob Eufer, Al Samborn, Dave Pringle, Ken McDonald, just to name a few of them were there. I think that crew was with my dad probably about 15 to 18 years uh, during a period when the station the was same very people. well. Yeah, same, same people. people. And Jim, the thing, I interrupt you for a moment, you mentioned McDonald. One of the, that's a point that makes local radio interesting because uh, Ken would come up with ideas and be successful with it, then we would top him. 
then he would come up with something. And there was always this competitiveness in local radio that stood the town real well in, in a matter of interesting programming. Mm -hmm. And Howard the same way with his uh, with his farm and home hour. Uh, that, that was part, that was very unique. This is a guy that built that all himself, right? Yeah, Howard uh, came in on his own, and as a matter of fact, he purchased the time initially and went out and sold the time to clients and did his own show. And uh, I, recall, I don't recall being there, but from a conversation that about a year and a half later, he developed into a position where he got his own show and. 31 years, he put together probably the Midwest's finest farm show. Yes, and right his name right. went beyond the local area, too. I mean, right. he was recognized as outstanding in that, in that National. National. And Then National. he got his own network. Yeah, he yeah. the right. uh, Michigan Farm Radio <coughs> Network, which is still run by Bob Driscoll and John Stolman and doing very well. Did you ever have to fill in for uh, Howard? Uh, all the time, uh, with his family home home hour at noontime. Mm -hmm. uh, went on vacation or something? Sure. Um, and uh, I was very good friends with Eva. And I guess we should not neglect uh, Howard's partner, Frank Giggler, who worked for years there at, well, at Frank uh, worked for years WPAG. There. Now, uh, Dave Prince, uh, he, did you become friends of Dave? Uh, yeah, when Dave came there, he's initially on the air. And in 52, when we put Channel 20, the TV station, on the air, um, it was run, they had a program director that ran it for about a year. And uh, when he left, Pringle uh, told my dad, he said, I can just do that and do my other job, too. So at that point, Dave took over running the TV station. We moved all the stuff out to the transmitter. And at that time, I started working with him uh, initially with camera work and then with the film chain and production. And I was between the junior and senior in high school. This station was very small. He went to vacation, and I ran the TV station, which was probably, I really enjoyed that part of it. That so right? I got to know Dave real well at that time. And you know, your dad at that time when I was with him, uh, we talked him into uh, having a man on the street show, which very few stations, there was one in Chicago, WCFL did, man on the street, and uh, I got the idea when I was with ABC at that time, when I came back, your dad, it was tough to sell him, but he, he finally said, okay, and we, as Charlie Wilton did the treasure chest from in front of Daniel's Jewelry, downtown Main Street, and he had people coming, opening up the chest with the keys that were handed out and became very successful. And I did the man on the street thing out of the Nichols Arcade. And, at, and uh, Ken did it later. That's right. Yeah. Hey, we have a call from Jim Michaels. Hi there, how are you? Well, we want to thank you for calling. Well, I just called to say congratulations, Ted. It, uh, it doesn't seem possible it could be that long that you were on the, on the radio. Of course, I'm, you know, you're... That's longer than I am old, but uh, <laughs> I, I had involvement there, and, and Wham was the first place that I had worked in uh, back in the '70s, I guess, back in '73. And uh, we used to we used to listen to you. I'll tell you a story, and, and while you're telling old radio stories, I'll tell one from the '70s. Uh, Doug Boynton and I used to sit in the newsroom, and I was a kid in high school and an intern, and uh, we used to listen to you in the morning. And of course, we used to take pride because we were on at five minutes before the hour. And uh, you'd come on to some of the same stories we had there at the top of the hour. We used to wonder, gee, is he listening to us or what? But uh, there was always a, a, a very um, healthy rivalry in, in the community, and PAG was always a very well-respected station. And I think um, really, as far as we were concerned, because Ted was there, and uh, you had a big following, and, and PAG always tended to do the kinds of class things and community-oriented things that a lot of the stations pretty much gave up in the 70s. That's right. That's and right. It was really, uh, it was very exciting, actually, um, to be, uh, well, learning the business in a small market that had um, really the potential and, and the talent coming coming through it that was ending up in the Detroit markets. And of course, that's where I went later on. But um, it, well, we had uh, uh, Alan Allman, I remember there sure. working. Well, you know, Arthur he could stay awake. Arthur Penhallow used morning. to work at the um, over in Celine. Uh, he started over there on the AM and. Um, you know, before he ended up in Detroit, I guess he bounced around a little bit. But, you know, he just finished 20 years in the same shift at uh, WRIF in Detroit. So um, there's a lot of people. Jim Harper, who's on NIC, he worked at WAM back in the 70s. Um, people may not know that, but uh, as a matter of fact, he was my uh, boss when I worked in Detroit. But, uh, um, and as a matter of fact, that we dug up an old tape of him, and he just about had a cow. But, uh, we, you know, there's a lot of people that have come through the station there, and, and Ted, you've it's just amazing to me that you've stayed pretty much in the same place there for so many years. So, in a very volatile business, and uh, and my congratulations to you. Hey, we want to thank you. Hey, thanks, Ted. For talking with us, Jim. Jim Michaels. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. 
uh, Jim uh, Bond, I think we kind of reached a, a real peak during those uh, years of the rioting in Ann Arbor. I don't think anybody came close to us with uh, being on campus every single night and uh, bringing the, the terror and the, the actual scene right to the radio. Yeah, a matter of fact, with your community comment show at that time, I think that uh, our friends with a local newspaper got a little bit jealous because the big things were happening were broke on your morning show. And I remember the one morning that you were trying to do your show and the, they were riding across the street at the draft board and our windows in the Hustle building were lined with CIA agents and right. so the people on the street looked up and saw them and it got a little bit uh, emotionally overwrought on the stairway and things like when Charles Thomas was in <coughs> right. being interviewed, the time that he was uh, going to the churches and stopping services and demanding money, he was on and some of the people who were on the other side, we were all in that one little studio and... Uh, but those times were great times for community radio, comment radio. radio. Yeah, they, they, demanded. It. Ted, you recall, because this was at nighttime, you recall when they all gathered in front of the president's home on... Um, I was there. And they said we were doing the remote with Don Herman and all. Right. And when the dog, when uh, Sheriff... Uh, Harvey. Harvey uh, brought the dogs out and uh, all those things. There, there was a Christmas and a, and a volatile atmosphere there at that time that could have gone really uh, into something uncontrollable. Yeah, we were there, and I can recall one time doing, and uh, I think PhD was there too, when uh, they were going to announce the success of the sock vaccine, and doctor, um, the local doctor was part of the uh, deal. Anyway, they held Francis, it. Thomas, Thomas Francis. Francis, right? And they had it, uh, held a press conference. Uh, NBC was going to break it out of the uh, uh, Rackham Auditorium. We all knew what the answer was because we were getting the information earlier, but we couldn't. We weren't told to break it till that was announced there. And NBC went and broke it before even they, uh, uh, they broke their own story before anybody else. And nobody could figure out what the game was. Well, I remember very specifically Bob Buford coming up to me one day. And he says, come on with me. He says, we're going down and, and uh, to the conference of the new football coach. And uh, there weren't very many people there. But I noticed when this guy retired, there were tons there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when Bob took me in there, there were plenty of seats. And, uh, and none of the reporters could uh, pronounce his name. I remember Van Pachter killed it that evening on television. He mm -hmm. could not pronounce Schembechler. And uh, I remember that was Bob's because he, he had an in and he, he knew who it was going to be from the, the beginning. And then uh, when Bob Ufer, I don't know how many people know that, but he stormed into the, uh, uh, the suite of uh, Jerry Ford and the FBI guys were on him because they didn't <laughs> know who he was until <laughs> Jerry Ford came out. And Bob Ufer was a very important man, you know. He uh, he was very important in uh, selecting the athletic director, and he was big. Well, I'll tell you one thing that nobody, I don't think, duplicated his hold as far as having a success on the air. I don't know of anybody. That's right. When he was asked to be the, uh, the uh, originator at WJR for the broadcast, it was only with the proviso that WPAG, his home station, was the one that originated it, and JR didn't have the ex exclusivity that they have now of being the, what do they call it, the uh, the big deal now, that when you have it, you're the, the only one. That's right. Uh, but, th this, was, this was Bob's, and he couldn't have done it had he not had that powerful hold as far as an audience is concerned. Steve, Bob was uh, a big enough uh, and important enough person that he could get away with uh, things you and I would never dream of. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, he would always have um, his pregame interviews from the stadium with the two coaches. Um, and what he'd do is uh, say, we're going to take a commercial break, and uh, I'll meet you down in so-and-so's locker room. And sure enough, 60 seconds later, he'd have a tape recording going of an interview that he'd done a day or two before. And we didn't... Then he'd take another break, and he'd say, we're going to go yeah. across the way and go into Bo's locker room and... and Sure enough, there came up that interview, and of course that was on tape. Eufer never left the press box. Sixty seconds after the interview with Bo, he was all the way across the stadium, right. and back up, you know, <laughs> third floor on on the press box, and there he was, ready to go again. And he never gave it away. Jim, I don't think we we had to pay coaches in those days. Oh, it's no. a big deal. They no. even printed in the no. newspaper what they're making, right? No. Now, right. He had all those uh, those talks with the uh, with, with those coaches. Right. Tom Tom would get into. Uh, the inner offices of all the coaches down there at the athletic building, and they were happy to be on. They were happy. They were right. nobody. Nobody had their hand out, and no. and uh, uh, I guess I started selling 
the Bob Elliott Show at Outstate Stations when we were originating it here. But let me say something about Bob Eufer. He was another guy who always helped everybody that he could that was in the business, and he had great enthusiasm. And in regard to what Steve said, Bob was extremely loyal to Mr. Uh, Bond right. and to the to Jim and to WPAG his, right. his entire life as he was loyal to Michigan because 1945 when they went on the air Bob was of course as he always did with selling insurance and he went on and uh, uh, Mr. Bond put on Michigan football I'm sure they had a heck of a time getting sponsors because uh, of the Detroit stations at that time and I think that it's uh, it was great that that he had that loyalty all right. these well, years. Well, that's been the big part of your uh, PAG, was it not? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. The loyalty of the people who were there. And we still have people in this era, yes. like Tom White and Dean Erskine, right. that are, have been with me, basically. Tom, Well, actually, Tom's been the radio station longer than I have, and Dean's been with us 15 years. And that's what it takes in the community to build that community uh, well, they, yeah, again, the reliance because it's believable. It was honest. There was nothing, nothing shady about the thing. It was an effort that was to, there and made itself felt in the area. Hi, Ted. This is Larry King in Washington. I'd like to personally congratulate you on this your 40th year in radio. It's quite an accomplishment to have a 40-year career in any business, but in radio, <laughs> an achievement. The people of Ann Arbor are very lucky to have you as their watchdog. Talk radio wouldn't be what it is today without you helping pave the way. So once again, congratulations, Ted, from everybody here at Mutual Radio. <laughs> like he was my buddy. <laughs> Larry King. Steve Filippiak, Tom Johnson, Joe Stefik, and Jim Bond. Uh, with us as we're talking about old-time radio here in Ann Arbor. Yes, yes. Ted, yes. I just want to add my tribute to you for your wonderful help uh, for 40 years. One thing I would like is your recipe for your charm and memory. Bee pollen. <laughs> <laughs> this is you, guess. You know that. Best wishes and to your family. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. We're here at 1130. Uh, uh, Jim, uh, let's... Uh, uh, we were talking about uh, some of these old instances uh, back in those days when... Uh, when things were different. Let's face it, radio was different. That's you had well, to, AM radio was still on top. FM radio yes. was And kind you of had to change over. with the times. Right. Right. Exactly. And uh, you were fortunate to have an AM and an FM. And uh, you do not simulcast. No, we don't simulcast at all. We haven't for a long time. And got, as of last April, we have two separate formats. Although with the AM, we stuck very much to the next older uh, format with news, sports, talk shows. Mm -hmm. And play-by-play uh, -play -play sports, and it's it's working out pretty well. And you have two separate staffs. Yeah, and that's a difference. So it's a very yeah, expensive <laughs> proposition. Well, and, and to your credit, it's not repeated as you have just announced your technique and your format, because I can remember the days when they wanted FM because they wanted to get away from the terrible music that was being played on AM. <laughs> so they allowed all these FM stations to be licensed. And then they gave so raunchy with their uh, music that you couldn't want to play anywhere. So they outdid themselves. And they said, in other words, what they said is, why did you give us a, not a license? We, we don't know what we're doing. See? But you held on to it. You played good music on your FM station. And you had separate programming. That's right. Which is what the game was all about. Hey, I remember something now that nobody else remembers. When Bob Eufer had a sports show that was so hot. And this was back in the, uh, the late 40s. That sports show was so hot that I remember people used to lay in the... Uh, in fact, I knew of one team that laid in the bushes. They were going to get him. Do you remember this, that hot sports show? And he would say anything on it. Yeah, he I, would call them terrible names. No, I don't remember the sports show, but we found... Uh, we were cleaning the Hutzel building here over the last six months. We found some uh, great big uh, electrical transcriptions of his sports show. And we haven't had a chance to dub them off uh, as yet onto cassette. Oh, you still have your tables that will play it? <laughs> uh, no, we had to find uh, somebody with a studio with turntables because, you know, it, it went from the inside out. Yes. You yes. remember that, yeah. sure. <laughs> Even I remember that. Yeah. Well, here I remember they could record at one time. Yes. Before, years and years ago. They had some kind of a recording. Uh, we were thing. talking about all Red the Ellis. Ellis. Red, Red Ellis. Red Ellis. Yeah. Scooby-Doo yeah. Club used to Hold do that this. every okay. uh, Friday night. You'd come into the studio and right. they'd make a recording for you. And we can't forget Jim Allen, who yeah. actually put a couple of stations on the air. Yeah. Engineer. Exceptional man. He was a gentle man, and he knew his business. 
he was ahead of the game in engineering. Well, I think this all points out something. We've, you know, we've talked about how the Detroit market has always seemed to overshadow the Ann Arbor market. But perhaps in, if you look at it in a different way, um, that allowed Ann Arbor Radio, Wham, uh, the old WHRV, OIA, WPAG, uh, and so on, to really develop something unique. And I think uh, Ann Arbor's radio history is just fantastic. What about, uh, uh, did your father ever talk radio in the early days to you? Well, I was brought up in the home when the stations were put on the no, air. Did you bring it at home? Oh, did somewhat, talk yeah. about? Mm -hmm. did but you not know? extensively, no. Did you know you were going to go into it? I had no idea I was going into it, and I think I was 28 years old before I finally decided to stay in it, so. I was on the air quite a bit when I was in high school, and if it hadn't been for the sales part, which you I worked with Ken McDonald. Bell, Howard Dietz show, I remember. Oh, yeah, when Howard got his accident, so I'd be out top of the morning to your neighbors out on remote. And <laughs> I remember one time he got in the accident, and uh, on Monday morning, Dave Pringle brought the stuff up. His, you know, At that time, he had a book with all the commercials in it, and they came up with these commercials that were all so old, they were yellow. There was nothing up to date whatsoever in the, you know, probably two years old, everything in it. And if I hadn't had a little farming background and been able to work it out, I would have been real bad trouble because they were talking about planning planning and it was uh, in a fall. How long was he laid up? He had a terrible accident. Well, he had so quite a while. I recall. I don't know exactly how was long. That, but was when that? he had his uh, jaws wired up, uh, that was the one I think was over on, at the Wayne County Fair. He was out close. Well, he was doing his show with a wire still on, it, on, his, on his cheese. He couldn't open his mouth, but he was doing his show. Uh, he was out about two weeks and then when the accident out on the old Ann Arbor Saline Road, he was out for a week or two at that time, too. But that first time, he had extensive plastic surgery done on his Yeah, and rebuild his space, yeah. Now, he actually went out and brought the farm, or the uh, the old fares, into the, uh, into the you know, through remote, into the uh, station, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He started all those. Yeah, the idea of the remote, and we were the first ones to have a remote trailer, and buy right trailer sales in Ypsilanti, which is a long time gone, <laughs> with our original trailer, which we had for years, and... Uh, and we did uh, just about every fair. We'd go out and do the remotes. Now, those have all changed because it used to be a county fair. We'd have the people in the community on the air. It was all active. Now, they're car races and they're you know, yeah, they don't have completely them. changed over. We don't do the remotes. How many, farmers, how many farms are there really now in Washtenaw County? Small, small number, I'm sure, compared to the days of Howard. Uh, yeah, compared to then. I'm not sure, but I read the article on Bill Ames, and, and they, they said this weekend, but now I can't remember how yes, much it that's has right. at that There was time. an article in the Ann Arbor News yeah. on Bill Ames. But you know, talking about, talking about those early days, and Tom Johnson reminded me uh, that we didn't um, really mention uh, strongly enough Lucy Gregory's uh, contribution to women's programming. That's right. And she had no, no experience, background experience at all when I brought her out here for an audition, and she took to it like a duck did to water. And she built an audience of women listeners because she went out and got many, many people to interview on the air. She had an actual ability. She'd ask a question and let the interviewee answer. Mm -hmm. She would never answer for the interviewee, as a lot of interviewers do today. That's right. And uh, But she was a natural, and uh, she she brought that phase of radio into well, the She stayed level. until she retired. She from... was the first woman locally, I believe. Right. And right. Uh, Judy... Judy uh, Dow, Dow no. uh, followed she, her. She followed Bonnie St. Kuehl was, or Bonnie was here for quite for a while. while. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> she, but Lucy, well, it was Lucy Dobson when she came to work for us, and she did a fine job. That was the time, and Ted was with us at that time. Remember we ran a, remember the cooking show we ran right. out to the yeah. Fox Village? Oh! Yeah. Between you and Lucy's audience, and we had 950 people there That's to watch right. a cooking demonstration. <laughs> it was I mean, the power of AM radio yeah. at that time. And Lucy would never uh, ask a yes or no question. Right. No, she'd right. always get an extended yeah. response to anything she asked. Is she uh, she was at uh, PAG when she retired. She retired from PAG, right? And it was sad that day. Uh, yeah, we had a little get together down at the Heidelberg. It was kind of a sad time because, uh, as Steve says, Lucy was uh, she brought something new into into the Local market. Radio, right? Well, I remember during the time she was there, I put her desk in the sales department because she was so upbeat and cheerful all the time. Got everybody up and going. So well, you don't you remember the day? It was a holiday though, and she didn't think anybody would be listening on the holiday. You want to say that? You remember I can't remember what she offered to give away? Was it her cook cookbook? Cookbook, yeah. Cookbooks, yeah. And cookbooks was... that were being sold. <laughs> yeah. She offered to give them away, and the phone started ringing. And really, it cost her it cost her a few bucks to get those cookbooks out to people. You see, you never know 
who's listening. You never know who's listening in radio. Well, I was taught back in the old days, you're, when you're on the air, you're talking to one person. And you're so interested in that one person to get your point across to them that it spreads like a pebble thrown into a pool and all the people that are listening are going to gain the same thing you're trying to get that get across to that one person. And she had that knack without, you know, she didn't, you know, when I brought her out here for, for an audition, Don Herman at that time was the program director. And uh, he knew that she was going to be there for an interview. So she went in and read the, the copy that Don had for her. And he walked in after five minutes and says, well, that's fine. Thanks a lot. And with that, she was excused. And she went home in tears thinking that she had flopped. And I, by that time, I talked with the Don Herman. And when I called her, she was uh, just completely depressed. And I said, well, when do you want to start? And, you know, when she gets excited, she, 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 she would stutter. And I told her then that she passed. He said, well, how come only so, it took so short a time? I said, because he was convinced in five minutes that you were capable. And there was no point in carrying on the interview. And then she, she stepped right in, and from that first day, she was something. And then uh, we used to do a remote at uh, Arborland in the winter. Schoolhouse. And the schoolhouse there with no heat, and the turntable would be frozen. Yeah. In that old trailer? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, Ted, I can remember back when we started the, the coach's show at the Frontier Beef Buffet uh, yeah. on Monday afternoons, sponsored by Coca-Cola. And we started out, uh, Bump was the coach, and there might have been 10 people. And eventually it, it turned into what the Monday coaches' meetings are now. Right. We used to have the football coach on, and then we got into the basketball coach, Dave Strack, and so on. And from a, a small thing, it, that grew into be... Uh, the Monty Coaches meetings, that's right. that's where it all and started. And now it's uh, is held before a, a, a five, six hundred audience uh, at Weber's every Monday afternoon during the football or basketball they won't let They won't let them broadcast it anymore, though. No, you know, no. you said the purpose was broadcast at that time. And by the way, speaking of Howard Heath, I've got to make one comment I think we'll all agree on is once you heard Howard read a commercial, You'll never forget it. <laughs> and he was the one who really, with his farm show, yeah. brought attention to the out, out, outlying communities. Well, I remember when Ted Bond took me off the air. I was running for school board. And uh, ten candidates appeared in his office to uh, make me uh, uh, stay off the air during the campaign, although we weren't talking about it or anything like that. And he had even offered them equal time. And... Uh, I remember that, yeah. But we had to get somebody in to read the news and so forth, but I was there, and that went on for uh, about four weeks. And uh, it really irritated people because we had, we had won by a majority of more than 3,000 votes more than anybody else. But I remember we went off. That's right. We went off the air. That day. We'll be back. This is Mark We Met on behalf of Ann Arbor City Council. We want to congratulate you, Ted, on 40 years of broadcast service to our community. Clearly, over the 40 years, you've been a guiding light for all of us, been able to uh, listen to you, talk with you, argue with you, and agree with you. But that's one of the great things about you and the way your show is structured. That's why, Ted Heisel, you've been so important to this community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. A council person who was with us here on a Saturday as we're uh, talking with uh, Steve Filipiak and Tom Johnson and Joe Steffick and Jim Bond as we reminisce through the years of what uh, radio has come through. You know, Ted, I was in the last six months we've been speaking of history. We have been cleaning up and hauling away all the old memorabilia and junk uh, from the Hutzel Building. And of course, Hutzel Building in 1945 was the first radio station in Ann Arbor. At that time, there was only four or five stations in Detroit. And uh, I was going through some things at my dad's desk and throwing them away. And at you know, the FCC, you have to apply for a license and you list all your full-time, part-time employees. And I was just skimming through one evening when I was up there and it had Pat Quinn, Al Sanborn, and got down to the part-time employees at part-time employee Ted Heisel. How long? I wasn't a date on the paper. How long ago was that? <laughs> oh, <No>, boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to go back. That was a long time. Hey, we have a call coming in from Harbor Springs. Bud Lester! Hey, Teddy! Hey! hey we thought it was you. Hey, Bud. Hey, hey, we hey, Bud. I don't believe it. 
we have uh, Jim Bond and Joe Stefik and uh, Tom Johnson and Steve Filippiak here. My gosh, is Tom smoking a cigar? <laughs> no, no, we made, no. Him, uh, we made him go out of the room with us. <laughs> we won't let him in the room. Okay. How are you? I'm fine. Hey, we've been talking about you all morning. You haven't. Yes, we have. Oh, my goodness. I've spent some time in Ann Arbor in the last, this past winter. Well, we talked about those days when we first started the, uh, gave up the record and started the talk show, and you said, go ahead. And, yep. and we talked about the days when uh, we got you to start the uh, city council meetings for the yep. first time on the air. I remember. And uh, Steve? And the uh, Bud, how are you? Hey, Stephen, how are you doing? Oh, fine, fine. Boy. Good, good to hear your voice. Nice to hear yours. I wish we could hear it at the stadium. <laughs> anyway, I brought up the point where you... I've lost all track of Slippery Rock. <laughs> you made it possible for Lucy and me to do our to do our program from the sky. Oh, yeah. With training uh, aviation. We did some great stuff, didn't we? Uh, oh, because you. You were ahead of the game 20 years right. ahead of your time. <laughs> well, thank you. I, uh, I wish... Uh, I wish we had been more successful. Well, <laughs> I wish too. We talk we about that it. often. Innovators don't always make a lot of money, but they have a lot of fun. Remember when you put the phones in the car for the news people? Yes, sir. To yep. be ahead uh, of uh, every, you were ahead of Detroit, ahead of everyone else. And but it's been bothering me. Ted and I've talked about this. What was the last name of the fellow that came out? Dan. What was that? Dan. Dan Kirby. Dan Kirby from Dan WJR. Kirby, we stole him from WJR. Yeah. And you were the only guy, I don't know if anybody else in the country would do it, but yeah. Jim, Jim Allen would drive the uh, remote wagon yep. the, uh, around town, and we would go on all the streets of Ann Arbor and uh, do a program. That's right. It has never been done before. Well, if it hadn't been for Jim, uh, never could have done that. Oh, he was a magician, that's right. Jim yeah. uh, made a lot of things possible. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, buddy, do you miss those days? <laughs> well, I, you know, I have mixed feelings, Ted. I, uh, I do and I don't. I miss the good times we had, but I don't miss the FCC <laughs> and uh, the harassment that they used to pull. But uh, um, I, I, I really uh, have fond memories of uh, all of you people. Well, but we do too. We have you you yeah. too, bud. And uh, I'm sure glad you included me on this uh, grand day. Oh well, we 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 did, it talked about you during that first hour extensively oh, you did. about the uh, about stuff and, that that happened. And I've been trying to get. Maybe you could send me a tape. Well, maybe we could. Could you? Yes. I'd sure appreciate it. Yes, we will. All right. And how is everything going with you, bud? Much better. I was just uh, in Ann Arbor uh, last uh, Thursday night and Friday for uh, a, a checkup. Well, listen, we had the big anniversary out here on Saturday. Well, we, we came home Friday afternoon. Oh, I see. The doctor said I was fine and uh, see him in four months. That's good news. That's fine. Well, that's good. Yeah, Deb oh, uh, what I did during the winter paid off, I guess. That's great. How's Debbie? She's great. She's she's managing. Give her, give her her best. Right of me. <laughs> well, she she sends be. you all your, her love. Well, thank well, you. Bud, you innovated a lot of things, including uh, Ted Heisel's talk show, uh, yeah. which was then Community Calendar, Community Comment. That was what we were doing. Community comment. Right. Community comment, right. We did a lot, of, a lot of good stuff, some crazy stuff. Uh, we tried a lot of things, and uh, that was the uh, enjoyable part. So uh, well, I can't believe it's 40 years. No, it doesn't seem possible, but uh, more than ever, uh, radio needs people you know like what, Bud Lester. You know what absolutely uh, sent me off the wall? What? I read what they uh, sold uh, our old stations for. We wanted to keep that a secret. <laughs> yeah, we were going <laughs> that. One and a half mil. We all yeah. thought of you, bud. Hey, bud, <laughs> one and a half mil, that was a, a pass price. It went four and a half. Bud. Yeah, four and a half. Yeah. Well, that's only money, bud, you know. <laughs> I mean, I would have bought a chain after that. You know, <laughs> each one of you would have been manager. <laughs> yeah, all, all the losses would have been paid back. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have come out smiling. Absolutely, yeah. That's That's crazy. <laughs> Well, that's what's happened to radio here. Same thing with PAG. Yeah, I know. They, they, uh, he, Vaughn had a gold mine there. And yeah, Jimmy's sitting here smiling. <laughs> he's smiling. I'll bet he is. Yeah, he's. Yeah. Well, he, he, he's still hanging in there, huh? Yes, oh, yeah. he is. Still fighting the battle. He's still fighting the battle there, and. But he's got a grin like a Chester cat. But, uh, Jim Allen uh, still around or not? No, no, no. Jim passed away quite a while ago. We did. Nobody told me. I didn't oh, know. Oh no! Isn't that a shame? That's so I think sad. it's been at least ten years, bud. Not ten. Not ten. 
Well, seven, eight years ago. No, well, you and I went over I there went together. To the funeral, right. I'm sorry, uh, we didn't think of letting you know. I thought somebody would. He's probably the finest man I ever knew. Yes, yeah, he was. They've got a... the best engineer they ever needed for remotes up there now. Pardon? I say they've got the best engineer in the world with for remotes up oh, there. For now. sure. <laughs> yeah, maybe he'll get in touch. <laughs> <laughs> ghost, <laughs> hey, that's Ghost to Ghost Network. Yeah, all right. That's very good, Ted. Uh, <laughs> record that. <laughs> Well, Bud, it's been a pleasure talking with you as the former owner of WOIA. Yes, sir. And uh, the fun that so many people had there, and uh, Lucy Gregory we talked about with you. Oh, yeah, a uh, real talent. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, well, my, my best to uh, all of you, Ted. And Our best to you and yours. Tom and right, Bud. I haven't seen Tom in, uh, I guess, since... He doesn't look any different. I don't remember when. Uh, Getting better looking every day, bud. <laughs> get, if I get up that way, I'll give you a buzz. I'd like to meet him sometime. Hey, listen, uh, what was that uh, we mentioned before that uh, he started at WIA? Don the what? What was that? Uh, I'm thinking of the uh, announcer that went with the Dan. Pist no, no. Went with the Pistons that started. Uh, Don Howe. Don Howe. Oh, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> I Well, listen, I can, re I can remember Jim Allen. Huh? And his uh, physical problems, racing Don Howe on the front lawn there. On, on the front lawn? Lawn of WOIA. Yeah? And I can remember leaving one day, and the cows were out there, and I ran back in. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Don went from here to there and everywhere. Yes, he did. I wouldn't know where he would be now. I don't either. I've lost track. Well, he's at some school uh, out of their radio station at Central Michigan or someplace like that. Okay. So listen, bud, thank you. Thank you very much. But listen, I want you to stay on the line yeah. because the producer wants to get your address and so forth. All right. Will you do that? You guys have a good time, and I hope to see you soon. Uh, all right. Okay, uh, say, hang on the line. Eric, take it away. Well, uh, we know through Bud that uh, that radio was it's a tough role, right, Jim? Yes, it is. Uh, the figures are bigger now, but it, when things are going well, it's as much well, fun as it used to be. But, Jim, it's a lot easier as far as pressure from the FCC is concerned today than it was when your dad and and Bud Lester was in. Well, I'll tell you, Steve. Right now, I have an a FM appeal going on my antenna move, and I've been waiting almost two years for my AM site move. So nothing's changed. Well, well it's, it's, but they're not they're not pressure. Well, we're all I think we're all uh, dated for uh, for something or other. Yeah, yeah the yeah, process so. is still slow. Well, they try to show anything. everybody that they really know what they're doing, and that's well, a, you can say and do things on the air that you couldn't do. What they're allowing to go on so I remember at PA wild radio is to me inexcusable. I remember at PAG we wanted to broadcast the uh, 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 the movement, uh, the black movement on campus, what was it called at that time, and uh, they were holding their big meetings at uh, uh, Rackham Building, and uh, because of things that were being said, we had to get permission, and uh, we got permission because we picked it up through a, a, a university station. And I recall back in the Nixon years when uh, uh, WPAG was applying for um, longer hours and the Mexican Senate got annoyed uh, at the Nixon administration for uh, whatever reasons and pigeonholed our... Yeah, how, well, uh, actually, no, that's the, it's a treaty with Mexico that governs the power increases. and But you fought that project. for years, didn't you? Oh, yeah. It's, it's strictly, I think... Uh, Every 10, 15 years, they renew the, the treaty and they make some adjustment changes. And at one point, I think the Mexican government felt they were taken advantage of. So the next time around, they kind of put the squelch on everything. And it's a very long, drawn out process. But uh, yeah, I have to this remember. last one got us our full time That's right. hours, though. One big event that, uh, another big event that happened there, they blocked off the entire street when I got to interview presidential candidate John Anderson. John Anderson, right. The and old Hutzel building. That's right. <laughs> on the third floor, and they had uh, uh, FBI men aligned along the stairs, and they put all the help in the back end of the of the station, and they wouldn't allow anybody up by uh, the studio where I was, except the cameraman, and myself, the dogs, and John Anderson and his uh, his guards. Well, and we had a personal interview there, on the air and off the air with John Anderson, and uh, I'll never forget that because uh, he looked right to me. He didn't hear a word I said. He just knew what he was going to say. But they had blocked off the whole street. Right. That was a big deal, and John Hathaway was responsible for that. I have to thank him. Well, you were 
you were with uh, Jim Allen and Lucy and me in that uh, wagon in front of the Michigan Union when the astronauts... No, I wasn't with you, but you were there. <laughs> okay, and they were supposed to right. have an uh, uprising around there, keeping the astronauts from coming into the entrance right. of the Union. Yes. And there was tension in the air at that time, and I was told, don't worry, they're coming through the front door. And it ended up going through the side door, <laughs> through the pool room, then coming down the <laughs> billiard room, and then coming down to the ballroom where they had their uh, interview. Right, right. Well, as, uh, uh, we're coming towards the end here. Is it, uh, is it just tough work for you, Jim? Is it as exciting as it always has been? Well, right now with the transition to the stations that uh, I'm associated with now, new call letters, uh, with a change in formats, it's very exciting. It's on a real growth You mean planet. you're going to change them? No, no, from the change oh, a year oh, ago. Oh, okay. It is really, really exciting with all the live sports and uh, things that we're doing. Okay. It's real and, exciting. And your, your staff is really bigger than ever, right? Oh, yeah. Joe, do you hope to get back in? I sure do. I think, as you know, Ted, uh, radio has always been my first love, and, and it's just wonderful today to be sitting in a studio that has memories for me with uh, some real legends of animal radio, Steve Filipiak, Tom Johnson, Jim Vaughn, yourself, Ted, and, and uh, it just feels very, very good to be back in here. Uh, and congratulations on 40 wonderful years. And then uh, Tom, he's still with us. Well, I come out, as you know, when I'm during the... When I'm not in Florida, I'm up here and try to help out a little bit so I can come on and have coffee with Ted every morning and and uh, do some work for for Mr. Johnson uh, Lloyd, who's a I think is a is a great addition as an owner here uh, in the Ann Arbor radio. And Steve, he just sits back and laughs at it all, <laughs> huh? Well, I marvel at the opportunities that these youngsters have now who are in in uh, the broadcasting business. It's wide open for them, Ted, and there's no. There's no stopping Jim, for instance, in uh, what he plans to do with the radio here in Ann Arbor. Right. And could be followed by other radio stations. That's no it. reason why not that you start here in Ann Arbor, Jim. Jim's going to be the home base for the Detroit Tigers soon. Great, great. That's news to me. <laughs> <laughs> Ted has to pull one out all the time. Uh, anyway, Ted. <laughs> Ted's gossip again. Uh, anyway, Ted, I add my congratulations to you on your wonderful career. And keep it up. For uh, an old man, you look young. Yeah, that's bee pollen, baby. <laughs> Serving southeastern Michigan's Golden Corridor, we are the Whitehall Broadcasting Company. We are WAAM, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti.